I'm Ravi Dar. For those who don't know me, I'm in the Faculty of Marketing and the Director of the Yale Center for Customer Insights. Welcome to the Gordon Grant Fellowship event at the Yale School of Management. Uh, before introducing today's guest, Victoria Mars, who's the 2017 Gordon Grant Fellow, I want to give you a brief, brief background on the fellowship itself. Gordon Grant graduated from Yale College in 1938 and went on to become the CEO of All In Corporation. During his life, his mission was really what business schools should be doing, and at Yale, we try to do a lot of it to so bridge the gap between business and academia to actively promote its change of ideas. <clears throat> this fellowship, was invited, was, uh, which invites business leaders to Yale, was established in 1973 to honor Gordon Grant. It's now an honor to introduce today's speaker uh, and Gordon Grant Fellow, Victoria Mars, who's the chairman of the Board of For Mars. Let me tell you a little bit about Victoria before we start today's discussion. Victoria is a graduate of Yale College, and then she went to the small business school in Philadelphia called Wharton. <laughs> She's a fourth generation member of the Mars family whose great grandfather, Frank Mars, founded the company in 1911. And it's one of those biggest kept secret, if you like, in terms of the company, $35 billion in net sales, 80,000 associates, operates in 78 countries. It's one of the largest family business in the world. The company is a leader, as many of you know, in chocolate uh, and with acquisition of Wrigley's in gum. And people don't know as much. It's also very active and a leader in pet care. We'll talk about a recent acquisition they made and food and drinks. Um, Victoria has worked for the family business, I'm told, for 39 years. I won't ask her how old she is. Uh, but I was also told if you count the summer she spent packing M&M boxes in the factory, it's more than 39 years. Uh, <laughs> her first position after graduating from college was ass assistant brand manager for Milky Way in France. And then I read uh, she worked in 86 in Dove. What was fascinating to me about the Dove story when I read, looked online was really this was like a startup within Mars, and, uh, and, and Victoria was sort of quoted as saying, you really had to do everything. You had to pack boxes, you had to make the chocolate, you had to do marketing, depending on where the slack was, where the constraint was, and I thought, gee, that is so exciting, and some of the things that consumer packaged goods that have become so large and perhaps so siloed need to rethink how do I create a startup environment in a large company to attract many of you who otherwise end up going to other names that we all know about. Uh, <clears throat> Victoria also became the first ombudsman at Mars. Uh, it's an unusual position, and she I know from reading online, she was very passionate about it. So we'll, we'll have an opportunity to talk about what does an ombudsman in a company do, <clears throat> how did it get started, and how is it continuing after she has, she's no longer in that role. Victoria has been a member of the Mars Board of Directors since 2006. She became the chairman in April 2014. In addition to being the chairman, she serves on the Benefit Funding and Investment Oversight Committee. Outside of uh, business, uh, again, very much like Yale's character, she serves on many different other types of boards, including the Livelihoods Fund for Family Farming. This is a social impact fund that invests money in projects aimed at increasing the productivity of smallholder farmers, which again sounds very fascinating and interesting way to build sustainability, who, which I think many of you in the room would be interested in. I know you're all eager to engage Victoria, so I'm going to start this off uh, with a few questions, uh, and I'm hoping after that uh, we'll be writing you. You know, we'll be riding your wind, and you'll be asking a lot of questions. So. So feel free to jump right in after the first 15 minutes or so, maybe till 12.05. We'll have a short conversation and then encourage you to ask questions. Maybe we'll distribute some candy and gum for each question. <laughs> or maybe only for the good questions, uh, depending on how much we have here. So please join me in welcoming Victoria Mars. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming to SOM. So I'm going to start off with a question, which is Mars is obviously, I mentioned, several $30 billion in revenue. It's sort of the largest kept secret. Uh, if you Googled Victoria Mars maybe three years ago, you wouldn't get a whole lot of it, uh, information on her. And so Mars has been on this journey in the last few years of opening up. So I wanted to ask her, start by asking her, we have seen Mars open up quite a bit lately. What has led to this opening up on part of the company? 
So first of all, oh, it's afternoon. So I was going to say good afternoon, everybody. And I, I'm thrilled to be here. It's actually the first time that I've come to this school. So it's you're in a beautiful building. That's a good thing. Um, and I'm quite humbled that you've all come to actually listen to me. So we'll start the basics of why would you all actually want to listen to me? It's not that I've done such fantastic things in, in the world, but hopefully I can inspire you all a little bit about what Mars stands for and why I'm actually so proud of the company that my, my great-grandfather really founded, or really, as we look at it, my, my grandfather is the one that really uh, got, got it going. So I think there's a, there's a lot of history that goes with, you know, why were we more private? And as you know, what you read and what reality is is a little different. So. Uh, you know, the secret thing that the, the media liked to make it sound overly secret. It wasn't really about that. It really was about our brands speak for themselves. So my grandfather was very passionate about, it's not about the family, it's not about who we are, it's about our products, and each of our products should stand on its own. And so if I go way back in the beginning, you know, you wouldn't even know that, that a Snickers bar was made by the same people who made M&Ms or that we were also in pet food and we had pedigree brand and the whiskers brand. You wouldn't have known that, nor would you have cared. So you know, we, it came from a history of it was about our brands, and we, they needed to stand on their own two feet, and they spoke for who we were as a company. Well, time has evolved. And now we, it comes from all directions. So you have consumers. So let's start with our consumers. And consumers, we need our consumers to buy our products. Uh, they're interested in knowing who makes these products and what does that company stand for. They're interested in, in knowing more about what's in their products. So this drive basically about, you know, they, consumers want to know who is behind their brands. So we had to kind of go with that and say, OK. So we'll start to talk about the company and not just to let the brand stand on their own. There's also a drive for, you know, that we get, we get strength from a connection. So if you know that, you know, you really love the, the M&M's product and you know that we make Snickers or goodness knows, you can be like, oh, I know that's a really good quality product, so maybe I'll try a different brand. And so that whole consumer area is one, one big area. Um, the other area, of course, is you all as potential talent. So you know, I know that, that today's world, you care about who you're working for. So you know, when I started working, you looked for a good job. You didn't ask yourself, what are the values and the principles of that company, or, or what impact are they having on the environment? It was, it was a good job. It was a, you know, a brand manager or a finance manager in a company. You looked at the job. You didn't necessarily care what was behind it. And again, that's changed. So now when you all go out and look at potential employers, you want to know, are my values going to match up with that potential employer? Am I going to feel like I fit in that organization? And so again, that forced us to say, OK, let's start talking about who we are. Um, because otherwise you all won't know and you won't even know to apply, let alone you know, know that we exist. So it's kind of been evolution that we've gone to. But I think the important part that's still, you know, we are a family business, we are a private family. Um, it's not about us, it's not about the family, it still is about our company. So you know, you'll read a lot about the business, hopefully you're not reading too much about us. I wanted to ask you about the recent acquisition since it's been the papers and many people <laughs> you know, often don't know that pet care is, uh, you know, it's you're strongly associated with candy, of course. It's a big part of the business and, um, and, the, and maybe the trend of humanizing, which has been going on for several decades in the pet industry that, you know, I treat my pet like I treat my family. How does it just fit into the overall Mars's growth strategy now that it's become even bigger than your candy business? Right, so, so we've been diversified as a company for a long time. And my, my, my grandfather uh, was, was a true entrepreneur. When I think about true entrepreneurs, the people that do things by the seat of their pants, have an idea, and just go off and do it. And, and that's really what he was about. So you know, whether he was selling ties here at Yale, um, or whether he was taking the $50,000 and going and starting with his our business and taking it over to Europe, or whether he happened to be wandering around the UK and saw, huh, you know, I see an awful lot of waste coming out of, of these factories, and I put this waste, I can put it in a can and make, make dog food. 
is how kind of the pet food world opened up. So for a very long time, we were in the pet food. And what we've evolved to is now a pet care um, segment. And, the, and pet care is our, our motto behind pet care is making a better world for pets because pets make a better world for us. And so we're interested in the whole ecosystem of pet care and not just pet food. And what that enables us to do is to fulfill our mission because by being in hospitals, um, by being in, in data, um, by being in, in science-driven pet food, nature, natural-driven pet food, we can get from our hospitals, we can, one, care for the animals, but we get a lot of data from what comes out of those hospitals. So we understand where are the issues? You know, what's happening with pets? What are the trends? You can then uh, take your research and put that into your pet food in terms of saying, OK, if obesity is a big problem in pets, which it is, um, then we need to make sure we're helping the consumer feed their pets appropriately. So you know, whether it's trends around, OK, wait a minute, you don't leave out a bowl of dry cat food. What used, people used to think you can leave out a bowl of dry cat food for a cat all day, and they won't eat it. That's not true. You need to portion their portion control for them as you do for humans. Same thing. So, you know, and the cats aren't getting out as much. They're more indoor. Dogs aren't getting out as much exercise. So, therefore, we need to get the calories down. So, how do we develop our pet food to make sure that we're helping the consumer address the issues? Um, whether we're talking about, we have DNA testing, so I can tell you what your dog actually is. You may think it's something, but it's something else. And you may also, it will help you actually understand that if I know that you have, you don't know that you actually have a German Shepherd because it's mixed in the breed that you have, I can tell you that I know that German Shepherds have big digestive issues. So what I will do is, when you then come visit me as your vet, I can say, you know, this is what's going to come down the line. If you want your pet to live longer and have a long, ha happy life, then let's make sure we start doing preventative stuff now with what we're feeding them and how we're helping them. So it's, it's all kind of looking at the whole ecosystem. And so the VCA hospitals right. fit in that whole ecosystem of being able to take care of pets. It's fascinating you're able to do that because when I talk to the healthcare companies, like let's take United Health as an example. The challenge is they don't have any control over your eating and your diet and everything else. They're controlling when you go to their hospitals or use their insurance. And they say disease management stuff, we understand fully well, but we can't do it. So it's interesting that you're able to do in pets what actually we are not able to do in humans very well right now in the healthcare system we have. Does it give you a competitive it's advantage? It's not easy, though. Let me yeah. tell you, because as you can imagine, trying to talk, I, I've heard this from vets, um, you know, if you are trying to speak to the pet parent mm -hmm. about their obese dog, it, <laughs> and they're obese also, that's a problem, right? right? So the vet's very uncomfortable <laughs> telling them, you know, your, your dog actually needs to go on a diet, and you look at them, they kind of match. It's, it's going to be a little, it can be a little tricky, but, uh, but, but the concept, yes, we think it gives us a, pet, a, a competitive advantage. It, it gives us a, we're not, we're not, we don't have a narrow view of what's happening right. in the pet world. And pets, as you said, have become such an important part of people's lives. And, and you know, some people are having more pets than they're having children. Mm -hmm. and, and you're right, they, they, they've humanized their pets, and they care about their pets as much as they care about, um, ab about their children. Uh, one of the other things at the hospitals, one of the big things that, that um, is important, like for humans, is getting your pets in for regular visits. You know, they've got to get their teeth clean. They've got to have their regular checkups. Uh, cats, it's a real big issue because cats don't show signs of being unwell. They, they hide pain and, and being sick really well. Um, so it's a big drive to get people to take their cats to the vet on a regular basis so that you can find things before it's too late. I mean, again, it's about how do we make sure that you have your pet for as long as, for a very long, happy life. Great. Just curious in the room, how many of you, if not at New Haven, had a pet while growing up, a cat or a dog? Or There's a pretty significant number, and I'm sure we'll hear some pet stories as we <laughs> go along. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, <clears throat> I mentioned this in the introduction about the, the position you started at Mars on Ombudsman, and, uh, and it was clearly you know, something that you were passionate about. And most companies at that time, certainly, I don't even know if now they have it. So what led to it? 
<laughs> what is the reaction? What is the role? And how is it continuing after you have left doing it? Right, right. So um, the ombudsman program. So yes, I am still very passionate about uh, ombudsman program. And and people will say, you know, once an ombudsman, always always an ombudsman. And that's probably true. Um, and my children will say to me, Mom, stop being an ombudsman to me. Um, so uh, but so really, it's, it was an interesting. Uh, adventure, I would call it, and my career and and was kind of an adventure, and one of the joys or not such good things about being in a family business, especially in a third generation at that point in time, as things evolve, things become more sophisticated in most family businesses. You have to put processes in place. But when I was working in the business, I'm the eldest of the fourth generation. It's kind of like, okay, where shall we put you? Uh, so they started me off in marketing, as you heard, in France, and I'm not a marketer. Uh, that was not a good place for me. And then I evolved into an export job, which was really about selling the product from my factory in, in Hagenau, France, to our other units in, in different countries there, and evolved to that. And then, and I still, uh, you know, where was my passion? I loved working with people, so that's when I started to trigger that I liked working with people. And then I went and got this MBA at this other school uh, because I knew that I uh, I needed you know I, I finance finance I needed to know solid I needed to be solid in finance. So I thought you know what's the fastest way to get to be solid in finance? Go get an MBA in finance. I did. Tick in the box. Done. Okay, that's done. I haven't looked back at finance since. Let me. <laughs> that was not my passion, but it got. It was a very effective way of building that knowledge. That knowledge quickly, and then I got into. We had a unit at that point in time, which was a small boat radar. Um, we had a marine electronics unit. Don't ask me how we got into that. It's a long story. I don't have time for that. But I was. I was leading that marine uh, electronics unit. And I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a boat person. I'm not a, an engineer. But I knew a lot about marine radars, and I could sell you one really well. It sounded really knowledgeable. But it was fun. It, ta it taught me about management. It taught me about managing people, all of that. Then you heard him talk about Dove, which was fascinating, a lot of fun. Best years of my life were the four years at uh, Dove International when we acquired it. It was an ice cream company. It was uh, Dove, Dove Bar Stand Alone. And uh, it was a seat of the pants, entrepreneurial family, uh, one of those fun times where everybody did everything, and it really didn't matter what your actual official job was. We all pitched in as needed to, to, to really uh, bring that biz business to life. And then at, the, and then at that point, I had, had started with under my, under my responsibility. I did have finance, and I had commercial, which for us is purchasing. And, and, and personnel, p and for us. So I had started with that, and slowly but surely I got rid, as the business got bigger, I ended up with just the personnel function. And I began to realize that, you know, people, that, that's, that's where I have a passion, is, is helping with people. I then took a sabbatical um, for, I'm not exactly sure how many years, but I took a sabbatical uh, that was not well received by my, my father and my uncle at that point in time because, you know, I was kind of up and coming and what was I doing, discarding my career and, you know, what was wrong with me. Um, but I did. And then I kind of was ready to come back into the business and kind of claw, trying to claw my way back in and say, hello, I'm here. Uh, I'm really interested in working for the business again. I kind of missed it. And, and you know, I, I haven't lost all uh, my marbles. I'm actually still able to think, even though I may have had a little mommy brain. But I really would like to be part of this again. And so I was kind of networking my way at that point in time. And my father and my uncle had uh, one of the big things. We had a big, at that point, it was called M&M Mars, so the, the group that makes the uh, M&Ms. Uh, and we had a sales meeting. We had a big sales meeting down in Florida. And about 500 people, salespeople at this meeting. And there was a big event, a big kind of banquet night. And my father and my uncle were up on the stage. And they said, well, so they said, well, they gave their, their spiel. And then they said, well, and we've decided we're going to start an ombudsman program. And it was actually my uncle who was talking. So, And my niece, Victoria, is going to head up that program. Would she please come up on stage? <laughs> That was my introduction to how I became an ombudsman. Uh, so I had no idea what an ombudsman was. I'm not sure they had any idea really what an ombudsman was. So I said, OK, I can do this. I'll find out. So I went and found out what is an ombudsman. I went and got the training to be an ombudsman. And I started the ombudsman program at Mars. And it was a trial at first, just in the, just in, um, the US, just North America. And you know, an ombudsman 
uh, is an alternative channel of communication for all of our associates, what we call associates, employees, to be able to bring any work-related issues in a confidential, so an ombudsman is 100% confidential, and that was one of the first learnings that my father was not aware of because, you know, he, I, <laughs> it was for associates. So my first, I had a few learning curves through this. So it was for associates. So I don't know, within the first three months where I was actually uh, an active ombudsman and began reaching out to people, and you have to sell the whole idea because most people, you walk into a unit and say, yeah, we don't really need you. Um, management's doing just fine. What are you doing here as the ombudsman? But I, I had not an associate just been fired <coughs> and uh, said, uh, well, two things happened. First, first question is, my father said to me after about a month, okay, so who's called you and how many people? I said, well, I can't tell you. It's confidential. What do you mean it's confidential? Well, you told me you sent me out to be an ombudsman. This is the code of ethics as an ombudsman, and confidentiality is at the, at the key of it. So I don't need to tell you who I've spoken to, nor do I need to, nor do they need to tell you who that they've spoken to me. So he was, <laughs> okay, fine. Um, the, ne <laughs> the, next, the next learning was after this associate that called me, and, uh, and I did change this one, uh, that had been fired. And so I said, well, I'm sorry. You know, it's for associates. It's not for ex-associates. So so I really can't talk to you. I can't help you. Well, she, of course, immediately got on the phone with my father, who then calls me and says, what do you mean you didn't talk to blah, 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 blah? And I said, oh, OK, well, I hadn't thought of it that way. But I learned to say, you know, we will talk to any associate, whether you've been terminated or not, whether you're retired. It's open to associates. Not that I can help you much once you're on the other side of the door, but I will open it up. So there were learnings along the way. So it's confidential. It's, a, it's informal, so it's not giving formal notification to the company. Lawyers don't like that at all. But the idea is that you know, if, if you come tell me that you have an issue, it's not formal notification to the company. That becomes a little complicated when we get around harassment and things like that. But we reassure the, the lawyers out there that don't you worry, we're not putting the company at risk. If there is an issue that's such as that, there will be a way that we will make sure that information gets to you, either by the associate actually being comfortable bringing it forward, or we have ways of making sure we don't hide anything. So don't worry. So it's informal, it's confidential, it's independent in the sense that an ombudsman should, in the best organizations, report into the CEO at the highest level. So you're not blocked by any of the hierarchical issues and political issues in the middle. So if there's a big enough problem that needs to be escalated, you can easily escalate it without it getting blocked along the way. And then the last thing, which is the most challenging part of the job, is that an ombudsman is a neutral. So you're not an advocate for the company, and you're not an advocate for the, the associate that comes to you. You're an advocate for fair process. So it's all about enabling and helping people resolve whatever the issue is that they have. It could be you know, they can't stand their coworker. It could be about they, why didn't they get promoted. They didn't have a good uh, performance review. Uh, they, they sit next to the bathroom and they don't like that. We do get things like, you know, well, you know, my husband's having an affair with a, blah, 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 somebody else down the, that happens too. But in general, anything work related comes to an ombudsman and our job is to really help them. The idea behind why it was so important, because, because our people are so important to us um, as part of our organization, and as we got bigger and bigger, you realize that the information and the knowledge that kind of came naturally in a smaller organization wasn't bubbling up to the top. And you couldn't, weren't sure you'd know what was happening. So this was put in place to make sure that senior management, the family, knew kind of what's happening within our, in our system. Even as we got bigger, we'd be able to do that. So, and it's a, it's a huge piece of engagement and a huge piece relative to saying, you know, you all matter to us. And, and it's important that we understand what's happening. And we want you to be happy and engaged as an associate. This is another way to help to help. And this that. operates in all the different countries yeah. you're in? Right. So I ended up being, able, the first one was successful. And I was able to then launch it uh, globally, slowly but surely. I rolled it out. And I'm proud to say that Mars still has what's considered a role model ombudsman organization. Um, and there are two pieces that are really make it role model. One is that um, all of my ombudsmen, including myself, uh, we are all multilingual. Mm -hmm. So we can speak to our associates in their language. I think it's like, now it's like at 85%. 
Right. So they're multilingual. Uh, second part that's really important, and so you know, people, people come to me and say, I'm really interested in being an ombudsman. And I say, what do you speak? Well, I've had three years of French in school. Mm, that's not going to do it. You need to actually be fluent in the language so you can converse with somebody who's usually upset. 99% of the people that call you do not call you to say, oh, I love working at Mars and the world is great. <laughs> it's about, eh, here's my problem. And it's quite emotional often. And trying to get to do that if in not their native language is very difficult. So to break down that barrier, it's very important that they speak. So they're, they're multilingual. And they're located in their regions versus many ombudsman programs. You know, if, if it's an American company, we're all sitting in Chicago. Waters, yeah. and, and just taking the phone. So my people were out in the markets. And they visit, and they're visible to to their teams. And one of the big things that we needed to, so if you go back to the ombudsman program way back, it was very narrow. Um, and you could see why organizations were not kind of keen to have an ombudsman, because they kind of say, trust us, don't ask us any questions, we do our job. And I realized very quickly that it was not going to work within this organization, because I'll get a lot of resistance from management, if they didn't see us as a partner. So we're partners in helping the organization be a better place to work for everybody. So this concept of partnership with management, without telling them details, I can tell them about issues. What's, what's not working? Our line managers are not well trained enough. Um, they don't have the skills to do this. Or we have a policy that is causing all kinds of problems. So I can generalize where the issues are, and that's what you bring to management. Or if you're working at a specific site, you may, may be working with that site manager or a factory manager saying, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in your factory here that's just not quite right. Let's, let's get to the bottom of it and help this make this a better place for you. So being a partner and, and, and not being isolated while keeping the code of ethics of the ombudsman um, is, is, is quite, quite different. So I have, I, well, I don't have it anymore. So I still, you see, I still talk about it with my team. But uh, there's one corporate ombudsman who took over uh, from me, who was actually one of my ombudsmen. Um, and we have six, six ombudsmen that, mm -hmm. around the world that cover the, the uh, 80,000 associates. So one ombudsman, depending on ge geography and how it is, could cover about 12, easily cover about 12,000 associates. Because again, it's, it's an alternative channel communication. And you almost look at like it as a consumer complaints. Mm -hmm. You know that you're going to get a small percentage. So your, your target is to get, my target always was 5%. I think reality is probably closer to 3%. About 3% of your population using the ombudsman program. But you know it's reflective of more because not everybody's got the courage to come. Sure. So if somebody comes with this issue, you know that you can extrapolate it and say, ah, this is how big the issue is. Great. Oh, anyway, it's well, a great program, and it's continuing to thrive, so I'm thrilled. I have plenty of questions, but this uh, is your forum, so I'm going to switch gears and ask you to ask questions. Uh, if you can also introduce yourself, uh, because there's some non-School of Management students here, and uh, you know your affiliation and your name, I think that'll help everybody know who you are. Uh, so there's some, one question right here. Go ahead, please. If you can use the... Hi, uh, Victoria. My name is Jessica. So I'm second year MBA. Um, so on your on the program that you mentioned, um, would you like to share how you at first established its trust with your employees as one of the family members, um, and how you uh, when you expand this program, how do you maintain the same principles when it gets large? Thank you. Right. Okay. So. Yes, developing trust, and and I think you know developing trust is probably a theme that runs through any organization, whether it's inside the organization or people outside the organization trusting the organization. Trust is really important. So you're right. So I I the first thing I did when I first launched it, and and my ombudsman still do this, but definitely in the beginning. I went to, you know, every, it was in North America. So every North American site at that point that we had and covered every shift and every location and spent, you know, 30 minutes, an hour talking to, launching the program to our associates. It was a foreign concept. So I had to introduce the concept to management and to all the associates that would be using it. And it's for man, it's for everybody. So it's top to bottom. But I definitely, um, spent a lot of time visiting sites and communicating about 
what the program's about. And then I really kind of use this word because I address the trust straight on. So there are two schools of thought. One, one school of thought is, great, you're a family member. We trust the family, so I will trust you. The other side is, you're a family member. Mm, why should I trust that actually you know, you're, you're, you will stay confidential? And that's really the key to people. Right? What I bring to you, how do I trust that it will remain confidential, that absolutely you will not tell anybody? Uh, so I, I said really the line I would use to kind of help this is I said, I know our system. I know that if I do not do what I tell you I'm doing, it will circulate so fast and shut that program down that it is guaranteed that I won't be successful. So all I can tell you is I, you know, I, I know our system. If I'm not being confidential, if I'm not doing and, 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 and operating in a way that I've told you I will operate, you'll know faster than I know that it's not working. And so it just was a time you know, building trust over time. And one of the things um, that was really important to me and, and for my ombudsman, there are two things. Currently, and, and it's, it's, you know, conversation changes, but for us, and it was, it was the, one of the original things that came out of a good ombudsman program, and we've kept it so far. It's the last job you hold at Mars. So you will never go back into becoming somebody's line manager. So again, that's the risk. You know, okay, today you're my ombudsman, and tomorrow you may be my boss, and you have information, even though you haven't kept, kept records and don't have, you have it in my, your head. So that kind of, kind of took that away. They won't come back and be your manager. And I need, and to build the trust, the other side of it is I required anybody that took one of these ombudsman jobs that they gave me at least a five year commitment because it takes time to build the trust and the knowledge. And if you're not willing to stay with it for five years, it's not going to work. And all of them, at least five years, some of them have been doing it now for 10 years. Uh, so, but definitely, those were kind of some of the things that we worked on to, to build that trust. But it came with time. And I was an ombudsman you know, for, for, for 16 years. So it was. Uh, yes, please, at the back here. Yeah. Hi, uh, here we go. Mark Bomford, I'm the director for Yale's Sustainable Food Program. And I actually had a question related to Mars's efforts in supply chain sustainability, um, which are refle refreshingly uh, large scope and long term compared with many of the other firms that might be doing less and marketing more. Um, specifically, I think the attention to the viability of the rural smallholder communities that are actually supplying uh, the start of the supply chain. And then also um, things that are not particularly charismatic, like the long-term genetic diversity of the species that you're dealing with there. Um, is this because cacao is a specific case with specific risks and it's not particularly substitutable? Or do you just have a longer-term planning horizon than uh, some of the other firms in this space? Um, what kind of combination of factors led to a somewhat more sophisticated, less marketing friendly, more nuanced sustainability strategy? Very complicated question. <laughs> I, I could start by saying yes and yes, and that would probably be the, the, the simple version of it. So one, one of the advantages, uh, or I think one of the big advantages, of being a family owned business is that we can think long term. So we can make decisions and hang in there, if you want to call it that, versus quarterly having to say, oh, we can't invest in that because our numbers aren't looking right. And so constantly being pulled back and forth by the stock market. We don't have to deal with that. On the other side, we still are a business. And, I, and often I have to have conversations with, with our associates when I'm speaking is we are a business. And a business needs a bottom line. And we need to be successful. We need to continue to grow. Because if we don't continue to grow and be successful, we won't be able to do all those other things we want, we want to do. So I think a real key is the long-term focus. We're able to think out further and say, OK, so what are the decisions we need to be making today? to make sure that in 25 years, 50 years, we have a sustainable business. We are basically an agricultural 
service-based business. We are a big manufacturing company, um, and you know we're, we were, we started as a family, you know, very hands-on. I mean, factory. I love factories. Factories are so much fun to be in. So exciting place to be. I know that doesn't sound very sexy to you all when you're all thinking about you know fun things, but <clears throat> there's nothing better than a, an operating factory and to see things come off. I mean, you can you imagine you stand at the bottom of the line and you just see Snickers bars just pouring down in front. I mean, <laughs> come on. How can you not enjoy that? Um, so, so we are. We we depend upon the agricultural, and, uh, and if we don't invest in our farmers, and, and there are far more small farmers than there are these big conglomerates that you know. If we don't invest in the, in the farmers, if we don't help them, and for cocoa, cacao specifically, so cocoa world, is specifically um, where it, somehow that world has been left behind in comparison to other ingredients, so corn and rice, they're way developed in comparison to cocoa. They're still like operating like they were in the 1800s. Um, whether it's investing in, 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 in the uh, actual way of farming and how you actually develop cocoa flavor and harvesting, I mean, all that's still way, way back. And um, so we realize that really that if we don't invest and if we do not think long term, we won't have the raw materials to make the products we want. So com combine the concept of, you know, we need to make sure that the farmers are educated. We need to make sure that the farmers can make a decent living so they can keep their families um, fed, so the children can go to school. I mean, it's a whole cycle because if you know, if they can't make a decent living, then they can't hire people to work on their farm, so they'll end up hiring their children, and it, or, pay, or using their children, I should say. And if they're using their children, then those children aren't going to school, and, and this, they never get out of the cycle. So investing in um, these farmers and helping them, so whether it's we're giving, helping them with the science, whether we're helping with the methods, whether it's helping them with finances, um, and education, huge education piece. So working the whole system so that in the long run they can be successful and we can be successful. And that really comes from our principles. And if you read anything about Mars, and one of the things I'm proudest of is that we are very much a principle-based organization. We have five principles that really are the family values, though they weren't written down until the 80s, these are the values and principles that we've grown up with. And so they sound very simple. They're, they're quality, efficiency, responsibility, mutuality, and freedom. Very simple in some ways. Very easy to deal with if you do each one individually. The real magic that makes Mars tick and really makes us work is you have to, you have to use all five at the same time. You're not allowed to trade off and say, I'll focus only on quality and everything else. No, that's not going to work. It's, it's the magic of making them, them all work. One of our big principles is mutuality. And mutuality talks about finding win-win solutions versus win-lose solutions. So you know, if we're going out and working with suppliers, if we're going out and working with farmers, if we're looking at the agricultural part of the world, just the world, looking at the environment, how do we create win-win solutions so that we both win and it's not a win-lose? A win so that's always been our mentality. So that's kind of what's driven behind all our sustainability, all of our interest in making a better world. Um, and because we're really proud about being a principle-based organization that you know, the principles drive it. That's why you know, anybody that works for us, it's very much not just about the what. So it's not just about how well you're delivering your numbers. It's very much about the how. How, how are you behaving? How, how do you operate with it, within the system? And so it, all that comes together. And that's kind of what leads to our, our sustainability program. And, it, and it's a journey. It's a journey. And it's not isolated. It, it's in partnership. We can't do any of this, any of these changes that need to happen. Um, it's all about collaboration. It's all about working with others and finding solutions and, 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 and looking at the long term. It's interesting you mentioned the win-lose versus win-win because uh, you guys, you know, at least in the School of Management, you take the course on problem framing. It's really, it's a lens. I think I think of these principles almost as a lens with which you approach a question. Because when, it, when you just say it, it sounds like everybody should be doing win-win, but companies don't do that. When we take a simple game and we call it the you know, war game, 
or we call it a United Nations game, people behave very differently as to your point. So it's, so if you, it's, it's a hard if you're in a working in a win-lose kind of a world to put a win-win frame, it's not easy to do. So I think problem framing is one of the classes we teach here talks about how you know you look at the same question, but people will approach it very differently, and that the DNA of a company that's really hard to hard to do, and it happens over time. And that's and that's one of the reasons to us, and we, we you know I know what I hear and, and is relative to how how you look at them, future employers. You're not thinking relative, or most of you aren't thinking, oh, I will get employed by company X and I will spend my career there. It's three years here, four years there, hopping around. That doesn't work for us. So one of the things that's really important to us is that we we try and persuade those that want to come work with us to say, have a career with us. We have so much diversity relative to product groups, and we can go between them. We have so much belief in terms of people moving. You know, as you said, I started in marketing. I ended up in, in, in personnel. We have plenty of people that start in engineer and end up in finance, or you know, wherever you want to go, you you could explore. Um, but because our principles and our values are so important to us. And it's the first thing you'll learn as you walk in the door. And it's not just like nice words up on the, on the wall or a booklet that says, here you go, now put it in your drawer. You're actually expected to live them. It takes time to learn how to live those principles day in and day out, how to make decisions, have your head think that way naturally. It takes time. So if everybody is just in a revolving door, then I risk losing my culture and my strength of those principles because I don't have anybody there that's been long enough to really teach the people coming in, this is what it looks like when you actually live the, the five principles. So this, it's, it's hard to maintain, but it's really important to us that we maintain those values and those principles over time. Other questions? Uh, uh, yes, please. <clears throat> Go ahead. My name is Roy Maurer, and I graduated from SOM at 87. And if that doesn't date me enough, I also went to Yale Divinity School in 74. <laughs> <laughs> so I currently work with a uh, boutique management consulting firm who actually has worked with Mars over the years. Um, here's where I'm curious is um, we see a lot of clients in larger established uh, institutions that are really struggling with the transition of some of the things that you pointed to about this digital networked age that we live in, um, in terms of both it really has changed the nature of work itself, <clears throat> but also another thing we're particularly curious about is what we're seeing is some, some real challenges in the transfer of power from us baby boomers to next generations who have grown up in the midst of this, whereas us baby boomers did not. And just by reference to that, to date myself, when I came to SOM, one of my colleagues asked me, so are you going to buy a computer? <laughs> and I honestly didn't quite know why at that time that would be essential. That's, that's how much has changed. So, so I think you know where I'm going with this. It's just like, and Bars, by the way, really does have a unique culture, as you say. It really is unique in the world of business. Um, and, but how are you facing that challenge? What, what are you seeing with that kind of transmission in the, in the really <coughs> in the very subtle ways in which the nature of work has changed? I think that's, I think that's you know, one of the areas that we're kind of finding and navigating through. There's still enough of us baby boomers that are still uh, leading. But as, as um, the next generation comes through, I, the challenge to me is finding the balance between uh, what works for the business, and which will help us be a successful business, and what is different from the, from the next generations. And allowing, almost allowing them, versus me telling, well, this is how it should be, allowing them to learn by failure of what will work and what will not work. So I think one of the things is, in your head, you can say, so I'll use it as an example. Um, I remember, oh, probably back in the same times, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a whole concept about, we'll no longer have any offices. There won't be any offices. Everybody will just walk into a place, maybe, maybe not, and it won't, you won't have your own desk, and you'll just kind of desk hop and walk in with your, 
your space, and today this is your space, and then you move. And I remember thinking, OK, I know enough about people, and I know that actually we're humans like to other have other people. We're not, uh, most of us like to be with others. And so how is that going to work? And I think here we are 20 some odd years later, and get once people are still building offices, and people are still wanting to come together and collaborate. So I think we have to allow the next leaders to work with some of our guiding principles that talk about you know, what makes Mars unique is our sense of collaboration. Um, we're very much of an open office. We don't have, we don't, nobody has their special offices. It's couple, totally open place. And you had this for a while, right? Forever. That's forever, what we've always yeah. Been. So, yeah. Um, and we are, I shouldn't say forever. My great-grandfather was not, but my grandfather, definitely. And um, so, because there are still some, you know, he, he was more the paneled room. I, I, and I don't know why it shifted, but my grandfather was not that way at all. And this lack of hierarchy, um, there is hierarchy within our organization, but we don't pay any attention to it, basically, mm -hmm. is what I should say. You can talk to anybody at any level, and, and there's no kind of uh, hoops that you have to get through to actually be able to talk to our CEO or, or any of the family members. It's just, you happen to be there, you can walk up and say, hi, I have an idea, I have a thought. So I think, to me, it's, it's really about adjusting, but allowing those that actually live in that world to adjust within the principles that we've put out there. So, you know, it's important to us that, that people collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to us that we have cross-fertilization between mm -hmm. departments. So collaboration, it's not just collaborate with the team you, you belong to, it's collaboration with everybody around you so you don't have these silos. So one of the great things that work so well in an open office environment for us is that, you know, there I, I may be in the marketing department, but that doesn't stop me from making a comment to the engineers that happen to be sitting over there that I overheard a conversation. They were talking about something where I have a view on. So how do I continue that collab cross collaboration between departments, between segments and things like that? So if I give them the the kind of guidelines of what the outcome looks like, then I've got to allow them to adjust to what works for the next generation. You know, I think this is really a key. I was talking to some students yesterday about how companies are actually moving back to, you had to come to the office, no working four days a week at home. And these are companies <laughs> who had this for 10, 15 years, and, but they've figured out the teams are not working, the casual collisions are not happening. And at certain stage, you really need that collaboration, whether it's interdisciplinary or even within a group, it's not happening. And I was very surprised because these are very large companies who for many years would attract students like you by saying, hey, you can work from home. And they have decided, uh, you know, I don't know what the data is and how they measure it, but for many reasons, they have, they have decided. And they said, and they know they're gonna lose people because yep. they have yep. built this culture over 10, 15 years. And now they're telling them that you have only these four cities to move into if you want to work with us. Uh, and these are spread over 20, 30 cities in the US. And they said, you know, we're going to roll the dice on this. And, and I think we'll, we're in the same similar kinds of situations where we're, and, and, and I think what's, what, you know, I had this even when I was an ombudsman, uh, you know, I would, I would say to people sometimes, I'd have to say, if you're so unhappy here and it doesn't fit your way of working or your needs, then you don't have to stay. It's OK. It's OK to say, you know what? This isn't right for me. I'm going to work for a different company. That's good. It's OK to make those decisions. And I think you know, different people have different needs. And, and we'll have certain guidelines and rules that work for us. And you all make choices on, what, does that work for you? Mm -hmm. or does it not? And, and you're right, the same issue you, know, you laugh about. You know, what happens? Of course, you know, four days a week, or you can work. Does anybody come in the office on Fridays? Of course not. What? Well, business still runs on Fridays. How do we keep? How do we keep that going? So, how do you find the right? And this is a challenge with anybody throughout your career, even you know, depending on what your life events are, is how do you find the right balance um, between all of your obligations that happen at different times in life, and and, and find the culture that works for you, that supports you, where you thrive and you help the business thrive, because it is win-win. It's not just about you thriving. I need the business to be thriving. So I need both. So how do you find that right balance and, 
and how can you adjust? And I think one of the things is, you know, flexibility without total flexibility. You know, we talk about you know earning the right for flexibility or what job you choose. You know, I, I talk about you know you can't be a shift manager in a factory and think you're going to have flexibility. You have a shift. You manage that shift. It only runs from this hour to this hour. You can't say, well, I think I'll come in at 10, or I think I'll work from home. No, that's not a type of job that, so don't choose a job that requires you to be at a certain schedule if that's not what's working for you at that point in time. Then make sure you choose a job that gives you the flexibility that you may need at that point in your life. Jeff, you had a question, I think, comment. Uh... Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, <coughs> Jeff Sonnenfeld here at the School of Management. <coughs> you uh, have uh, given us an, uh, an amazing tour through uh, a, a unique enterprise that speaks um, unusually well to SOM values. What, what I think so many of our students and faculty are interested in as an enterprise, we talked about the sustainability of uh, food production, or we talk about other environmental interests you have. I believe you don't market to children, don't advertise to children that is under, under 12, the commitments you have to uh, try to avoid artificial colorings and sugar substitutes, your five principles. I think Kyle Bush, uh, you had mentioned to me your, your uh, NASCAR driver even has to live by those five principles, uh, yeah, which is uh, uh, pretty, uh, number 18, is it, the car? Yeah, it is. Is, uh, <laughs> is the, uh, the m and Mars has a NASCAR. Maybe what you learned overnight. Yes, I, mean, I know. <laughs> I, I've learned not to criticize NASCARs, for sure. <laughs> is so many things uh, about this business, though, speak to an answer you gave us a few minutes ago to that great question about uh, the family ownership. And, and this last question now, too, is just asking, as you move from a, a fourth generation into a fifth generation of family ownership, it's, it's really unusual. <laughs> Taking a look at what happened to Heinz or what's happened to many of the great old newspaper chains or what happened to DuPont as the DuPont family left control and things, uh, do you worry that a fifth generation won't be able to take that same long-term perspective? Can you be a public company uh, and not family dynastic capital and still live the responsible and produce the responsible ways you do? Or do we have a problem in capitalism that's not discussed in public, you know, uh, market capitalism, financial capitalists? You can look at places like Ford or Campbell Soup, uh, some who I think have tried some structure to maintain family control. Uh, Wrigley's thought they were going to do that, and they, uh, obviously you're, you're proof they couldn't do that, but you've saved them anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How can you do it? What, what ownership structure will we see that will keep this company going from a fifth and sixth generation going forward operating as you do? It's very complex. So uh, anybody that thinks that a family business world is simple and easy. Just imagine that you know you all have your family over for Thanksgiving and you have a lovely time and then you all say goodbye. And you may not see them for another year or you may say so imagine that you know in a family business those are the people you have to work with, those are the people you see, those are the people that you have to come to alignment with. So it's very complex and Many family businesses fail when they get to about the third or fourth generation. And it's very much about size. I mean, so it, it all depends on where you are in the evolution. But you know, you start with one, and that's easy. OK? They make all the decisions. And then by the time you get to the, the, the sibling partnership, so then you've got some brothers and sisters that are trying to work together. And OK, you still have a small enough group that, that they can talk to each other on a regular basis. And then you start getting into the cousin groups. And once you start getting into the cousins group, of course, you had different parents, so you have different views and different input. Uh, then it even gets more complicated because as you cousins begin to marry other people, of course, they come with all their views. So a, a family system is very complex. And the advice that we've gotten, um, no guarantees here, but the advice that you really get is the sooner you can do two things. One, you need to create family engagement. So you all, I'm sure, have heard about work engagement and engaging your employees. 
uh, we work on that whole system too. But how do you keep the total family engaged and feeling valued? You know, they have a voice, uh, their opinion counts, um, without allowing them to interfere in everything. So it's, you know, how, how do you find that right balance? And what systems do you put in place to manage that? So in the same way that you look at an organization and have to implement policies and systems, you need to look at your family in the same way. Now, you know, for my father and my uncle and that generation, it was like, what's the problem? Why do you need to do this? You know, can't you just talk to each other? Why do you need to have these meetings? Just pick up the phone and talk to you. Well, it's easy. There was your brother and you sat next to each other. That's easy, okay? We're not. We're spread all over the world. So we need to have these meetings. You know, why do you need to do this team building stuff? Why do you need to do out hugging trees? You can imagine, you know, that routine. Um, because we need to learn to communicate together. We need to learn to work through differences. So family systems are absolutely critical. So creating, we've worked really hard in the last 15 years to create that family system and actually putting policies in place. So, you know, when I started as uh, working, there were no family employment policies. Now, for the next generation, there are family employment policies. Here are the rules of the game of if you want to be employed by the business, and the business has said that having family members work in the business is better than not having family members, even they'll put up with all the crap that goes with it. Um, but it, they'd rather have them than not have them. But we have some policies that say, OK, here are going to be the rules of the game, because what, what happens in families? That's not fair. How come he got that? And how come she didn't get that? This is what you're dealing with. So the more you can prepare yourself with policies and systems that people may roll their eyes at, but you need them because something will happen. There will be bad things that happen, and you need to be able to do the best job you, to, you can to manage, manage through it. So keeping the family engaged. Then the next part is, and, and people have talked about this, and I've come to realize even more, the further you get away from the original founder, the less emotional connection the family has to the business. And so how do you keep that emotional connection? So, you know, I knew my grandfather. I knew I, you know, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather. So I have that emotional connection. You know, my children knew him for a very short, my older children knew him for a short while. So the further you get away, the less there is connection. So how do you keep the connection back to what is this business? What does it mean to you? And so I talk about very much about the importance of keeping our five principles going is not just for the associates in the business, but it's all, that's the emotional connection for the family. That's what makes us proud of Mars. It's not about how big we are. It's not about you know, how much money we make. It's a piece of it. But what makes us really proud is when you read things or you hear things, even if you're not involved in the middle, about what we do well. Where are we having an impact? Where are we having a positive impact, whether it's environmentally, whether it's on people, whether you know, it's in the, in the towns where we have our factories. So that's what creates that sense of pride and connection. So keeping a link and a knowledge base with family members, even though they aren't employed or maybe at a distance, is really absolutely critical to keeping it going forward. So our view um, is, is, and then the other thing, the other piece that happens as you go from one generation to the next is you've got to start separating, clearly separating responsibilities and decision making. So when it was my father and my uncle and my aunt, they were both the board and the owners and the operations leader. So it's all in the same place. Who cares? As you get bigger, that separates out. So then we need to make sure that everybody knows that just because you're a family member doesn't mean you can go tell management what they should or shouldn't be doing. You know, we have the board. So if you're on the board, well, then what education do the family members need to be qualified to be able to serve on the board? What do they need to be qualified you know, to work in the business? So things become much more structured. Education, 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 communication, 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 bringing people together. Uh, we've done a great job, I think, with the fifth generation. We started them really when they were quite young. I mean, the, the oldest fifth generations are now in their um, 20s and, and 30s. And we started them quite early on just basic 
um, communication training, team building training. Now they used to go, do we have to do one more of these team exercises? You know, how many times do you want me to put together a little something? Or how many times do you want me to climb over that wall and show that we can actually get the team over the wall? You know, you've done them all, right? So, <laughs> you know, how many times do I have to take, you know, uh, the FIRO B or I have to do the, the, you know, all the different tests out there to decide what my personality is and blah, blah, blah. So, but I can now see all that time we spent invested in them when they were young teenagers to now you say that group you know works together. they know how to communicate with each other they know how to deal when when they disagree they can disagree with respect and work their way out of it my generation a whole different generation so we didn't have that training so you you have to invest in the next generation you have to so our 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 goal is to stay remain a, a privately held business i can't guarantee it um, but that is my passion. Um, I, if we were a publicly traded business, I would lose total interest. It, it, then I, I, can't, I can't influence it in the way that I can influence it now. I can influence it to be the best company. Once it's publicly traded, it kind of loses its appeal to me. So our goal is to remain a family-owned business with great structures and, and good education and clear, you know, this is how board members become a board member. Uh, this is the structure of our board. This is how the owners eventually, because not all owners will be on the board, of course. This is how the owners have a voice. So the board knows what the issues are the owners are concerned about. Um, but it's going to, the biggest challenge, I think, as we, uh, as it moves from being a passion, so I would say, you know, from my father and my uncle and my aunt and many of those in my generation that have been very connected to the business, it's a passion. It's a passion. Um, but as we move from generation to generation, it's really important that the business continues to deliver financially so that family members can say, it's worth leaving my money in Mars versus taking it out and investing it somewhere else where I can do much better. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep them emotionally connected and the business continues to deliver solid financial results so you don't have family members saying, eh, I'm not sure I want to leave my money here then things unravel. So it's a complex, it's very com complex. No, I think those dynamic. are fascinating insights. I was thinking <laughs> about some of the startups I worked with, you know, with even when you go from the founders with three employees to six employees, mm -hmm. it's amazing to see how much bureaucracy just few changes creates because of the pa differences in passion, understanding of each other versus people who came in and let alone, you know, if you move to having 50 or 200 employees. And similarly, it's very amazing to see how you work on it very proactively. I want to end with a question uh, from one of the students. I think I know we hot a lot of the others, but I think it'll be great, great to conclude the question from one of the students. Yes, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Say that again, I, can't, I didn't hear that. Yeah. Most, a lot of people like to call it uh, <clears throat> the real school of business for creating and training. The real school business, is that what you said? Real school of business, right. Real school of business, um, okay. For training and creating best managers. And a lot of people who worked in Mars Inc. became uh, CEOs and top executives in other companies. My question is what kind of programs or uh, system do you have you know, to create such great employees and executives. Thank you. Uh, I, w I think what I would say is we, systems is not what I would use as a description. One of the, one of the things that, you know, if you're working for Mars, uh, if you think that somebody is going to lay out a plan for you that says this is what it will look like for you to get to the top, then Mars is not the right place for you. It's very much about opportunities are there you're going to have to take them. Um, so, you know, we, we can give you plenty of examples of people that, you know, have meandered all over the place. Um, but what we look for and what we encourage is, and those that are, are quite successful, is this sense of, of adventure and open-minding and risk-taking. So, and, and 
development and learning is not just about up. Development is also across. So, you know, whether it's international assignments, whether it's getting out of your comfort zone and saying, you know, let me go try finance. I know nothing about finance, but I'll make I'll be a better general manager at the top. Um, is is one is one of the things. So, taking on your own career and shaping it to be what you want it to be. Um, that being said, because we're a very decentralized organization, we actually have quite a few um, what I would call small general manager jobs out in the world where you, know, you, you can act as if you're running your own business with quite a bit of freedom, which gives great, uh, gets to be great training and great managers. That also said, you know, we, spoke, we focus a lot on line manager training, so your capabilities relative to managing other people. Because managing other people, and you know the saying, you know, people don't leave a business, they leave a manager. So uh, managing, being good managers, being people managers, you know, people are evaluated based not just on what their financial results were or how good a manager you are. So you could have the best, you know, the, 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 the best deliverer of their financial numbers but it's got dead bodies around them, they're not going anywhere in our organization. Um, usually they get caught pretty fast. I mean, they can sometimes slip through the cracks one or two levels before somebody goes, wait a minute, wait, what's happening here? But it, it's really about creating people that, that care, that are compassionate, um, that take pride in team versus me. So very much of an organization, we win together. It's not about, look at me, I'm the star. So I think it, you know, there are many different pieces that kind of make it so that we, we do. Unfortunately, we do have some people that are successful and then choose to go somewhere else. Uh, but we have many that stay with us for many, many, many years. Um, and we recognize that too. You know, if I, I, I walk into an office, I always use scan desks. Because it's open office, I can see everybody. Um, I usually scan desks because we actually have service plaques. You know, people collect over time, so I can see you know, how long you've been with the business, 5, 10, 15, 20, uh, 25, 30, 40 years. And it's, you know, that gives you a sense of, OK, how, how long have people been around and how well, uh, what's the maturity of that organization relative to knowledge of, of how Mars functions? Great. We are at the end of our time. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, audience.